join us back. Well, thanks uh, so much for coming to the Peloton Moms Book Club tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. There she is. Hey, Hi. Jean. <laughs> no, okay. that's okay. We haven't started yet, right? We have not. Mm -mm. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, well, it is seven o'clock, so I know you got your time is precious. So we'd like to get get started on time. And I know we had a lot of moms said that they weren't going to be able to make it tonight, um, but they were going to catch it on our YouTube channel later. So we'll go ahead and get started. Last year, Jean's book, The Plot, took the Peloton Moms Book Club by storm, as well as the rest of the world. And so we were so excited to have her back to the Peloton Moms Book Club tonight. And this time she bought a very special friend with her, Julia Whelan. Um, the narrator for The Latecomer, and a multitude of other books. So welcome, Jean and Julia. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me get a few quick poll of two, whether it would be appropriate to, to, to bring a glass of something. And I, I approve this on behalf of all of you. So uh, I hope yes. that's okay. <laughs> it's totally fine. I was wondering whether Julia was going to have a glass of tea with her, but I totally support the wine. <laughs> so, oh, I'm done. I'm done today. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. let me get a few quick thank yous out of the way before we dive right in. Um, first off, thank you to Jean and Julia for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. Thanks to Jennifer Crowley, the group's founder, for everything that she does behind the scenes to make these chats possible. Thank you to all of the moms who've already read The Latecomer, shared their love for it in the group, outside of the group, just sang the praises far and wide. And to the moms who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but have it on their TBR, we hope you get to it soon and be sure to circle back to the YouTube channel and check out this chat a little later. And last but certainly not least, thank you to Macmillan, Macmillan Audio for helping also to facilitate this chat. So without further ado, um, let's dive right in. <laughs> So for our members who may not have had a chance to read the book yet, Jean, go ahead and share with us in your own words what the story of The Latecomer is about. Well, how to encapsulate a book of 450 pages into uh, what, what the book is about. You'd think by this time I'd be better at this. I tend to say, and this I know is a bit of a cop-out, that it's about a family, which is, which is such a catch-all for so many books. I mean, if you think of all the books that could be described that way, it really brings no clarity at all. But it, it is about a Brooklyn family, uh, uh, very, very complicated and not very nice family um, for most of the book anyway. And they are, they have an unusual configuration in that they have triplets, um, in vitro triplets. Um, and then many years after the triplets are born, as the triplets are in fact about to leave home, they, the parents make the to me, unfathomable decision to have another child and not just any other child, but a child from a leftover embryo from the triplets. So they basically produce this latecomer, um, you know, and a generation after their kids. But if you think about it a different way, this child is the same age as the other kids. So the questions that kind of got me going when I started to think about the book were, there were two. One was, how is this a good idea? I mean, what has to be what has to be happening in a family for this to seem like a good idea? Um, because you know, I, I'm I'm not a Peloton mom, but I am a mom, and I think uh, at the very la the very last thing I would have thought of doing when my uh, younger child was about to leave home was, oh, I know, <laughs> let's start all over again with another child. Um, although I, I knew I was gonna miss him and I compensated in other ways that I'd be happy to elaborate after I sip some of this wine. But I just thought that was an extraordinary thing for a family to do. The other question was, what is it gonna be like for that kid when they figure out the gestalt, you know, the entirety of their existence that if through some random act they were they missed their family and in this case they really did miss one version of their family so that's what the book is about it's not exactly an elevator pitch unless you know it's an elevator to the top of the empire state building but that's what i got and i don't think i'm gonna do any better than that I think that works. It definitely summarizes the story well. It was very layered, a lot going on. Even though it wasn't a thriller, we had plenty of 
plot twists in a literary novel, which I appreciated. And we will definitely circle back to that and chat with it about those things a little bit later. But Julia, how did you come to get involved with the latecomer um, and the narration? Did you read the book first? Did you reach out to somebody or just give us a little bit of insight, please? Uh, sure. Yeah, this uh, beautiful book came to me the way books come to me, which is that a producer at um, in the audio division of a publishing house, in this case, Macmillan, reached out to me and said, um, do you have availability and interest in doing this book? And I saw Jean's name and I was like, yes. And then I saw the description, the synopsis, and I was like, this sounds incredible. Again, like Jean said, not something I'd thought about or encountered before. And it, um, it just seemed super compelling. And so I, uh, once I was able to figure out scheduling and I was a hundred percent in. So, and at that point, then I read the book and realized what I'd actually signed up for. And um, it's just phenomenal. So what, what phenomenal. she doesn't say is that she's actually every publisher's first choice. So <laughs> yes, she turns down, I'm sure you must have a huge swap of books that you turned down, but you know, it's I mean, it's a random thing. Yes, no, what I, I definitely, I mean, it's, it's, that's very flattering and thank you, but um, they, you know, producers get to know my style and they know what I like and they, it's a, it's always like some alchemy that happens between narrative voice and then author desire and then um, what if, if a producer thinks that I'm right for something. So this was like just such a, such an honor and I, I love this book so much and I've talked about it a lot. So um Anything you want to know, I'll talk about, especially as Jean said, let's just skip. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, club, let's just right? have a conversation. It is book club. And if I address one question to one of you ladies and the other ones to chime in, please feel free to do so. Um, it was It's interesting to me that you didn't get, you didn't read the book before really committing. Do you, is that something that is normal in your process or what percentage it of the is. time do you think that? I'm never able to read the book before I commit to it. Um, I don't have the time, the, they don't have the time to wait for me to read, to decide if I can do it. Um, sometimes the manuscript doesn't even exist yet in a readable form, um, when the ask comes in. So I have to base it on the synopsis and the author and the trust that I have of the producer who's bringing it to me. Boy, have you ever said yes to a book and then really regretted it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, oh, you don't have to give never. us the title. Not to but... tell us. I mean, you know, no, <laughs> never. Not in the main characters we're called. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, honestly, at this point, like this is part of where I'm just, I'm so, so lucky to have, you know, been in this business for so long and to have the relationships that I have where like, I just, it's kind of, uh, it's just a buffet of like great books. And I'm so fortunate at this point. I mean, definitely earlier in my career, there was stuff that I'd be like, why am I doing this? Not only do I, you know, it may not be a book I particularly want to read, but I'm also like wrong for this and why am I doing it? And, you know, um, this was just, this was lucky. Well, this question is kind of to the both of you. Um, how collaborative of a process was getting, was bringing this book to life um, through the narration. Did you guys reach out to one another and have lengthy discussions over tea about character motivations? Yeah. Or did you receive an audio file every once in a while and give you any feedback? Let's just talk about the collaborative process. No, it, 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 we had one long conversation, which I think covered everything that Julia uh, needed, but that was one hour more than I'd ever had with I should say that I am an audiobook listener. I mean, I constantly have an audiobook in my, in my going on in my through my phone, through Libby, which is this, uh, you know, library public library app. I was listening to an audiobook today, um, so it was something I always wanted to do. But for my first few novels, nobody would record them and I used to like beg my publisher and they would say no <laughs> and then when I started getting audiobook recordings I was thrilled um, but the first couple ones were pretty bad and um, I was happy with uh, Kate Burton who recorded um, The Devil and Webster which was about two books ago and then I actually got to choose the uh, narrator of the plot and I think I chose well but not everybody liked it and there were parts of it that I didn't like. So I, 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 I came to this with a certain amount of trepidation. I was grateful to Julia for reaching out to me and talking about some of the particular challenges of this. 
uh, novel, namely the fact that the narrator is unknown uh, until a certain point in the book. And how do you deal with that? How do you um, create a voice without tipping your hand? Because the identifying the narrator is one of the big reveals of the book. And she just handed that so beautifully. So very, very happy with that. Yeah, the um, for me on, on my side of it, I, I like to have as much uh, back and forth with an author as I can, but sometimes the book doesn't warrant it. Like sometimes it's just you know, I, I understand the assignment and I'm able to go do it. And if they can answer my pronunciation questions, then I'm, I'm good to go. But with this one there, what Jean said is absolutely true. Like how to necessarily tackle this, this, uh, narrative voice. And then also for me on the pronunciations, there were a number of, um, pronunciations that I wanted to make sure were like culturally accurate for how she was conceiving of this family. Um, so a lot of the Hebrew words, for instance, wouldn't necessarily have like official appropriate Hebrew pronunciations. Cause that's not this family. Like they're a pretty secular, <laughs> you know, New York Jewish family. And so I wanted that gut check from her of like, how do you think they're saying these words? And that's kind of how the conversation started. And then we started talking about art and we started talking about because there were also all the artists that we had to cover um Flemish names I felt so badly for uh, yeah there was you know it there was there was a fair amount in this it's also it's a it's a good sized book you know mm -hmm. it is sorry about that I, no, I loved every minute of it <laughs> My, my mother in particular was begging me to get rid of all the Mormon stuff. And I just, I couldn't do it. I mean, I, I, I nope. thought it was Mormons. She said, take yeah. out the Mormons. Nobody wants to read about Mormons. No, you're wrong. Everybody wants to read about <laughs> Except Mormons. Want to read about <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, that character certainly had a journey as did they all in this book. It is long, but I mean, you take us on such a ride that it's warranted. I'm curious as to... The final draft that we read, you know, is 450 plus pages. Was there a lot of editing down from the first draft or was it kind of, did it stay through the whole way? I can barely remember the first draft. This, this, this novel required more writing and cutting than any two or three books I've ever written. Um, and I, I don't know if, um, if, I, if I talked about this when I was here, to talk about the plot, but I actually started The Latecomer long before the plot. And I got myself so tied up in knots and so kind of actually, pick your metaphor here, lost in the wilderness, picking myself into a corner, banging my head against the wall. I was so stuck. If I tell you that there was a draft in which the Oppenheimer family were on a boat sailing around the world, this is true. So that was 75 pages right there that, that hit the floor. Um, I was really lost and my editor understood this and she said to me, put it down, step away from it and write that other thing that you told me about. Um, and so I, you know, I, I put this whole project aside in order to write an entirely different novel. And when I went back to it, then I saw what the problem was and I saw what the solution was. So there were so many drafts. They were crazy drafts. At one point, the Oppenheimer family were all in Germany making a documentary. I mean, it was just crazy. But I, I really feel that I had to get it wrong so many times before I could get it right. It was the hardest book I've ever written and um, the most satisfying to finally bring it, bring it in. Well, I'm happy to hear that it was the most satisfying. Hopefully everything that you write after this will be a piece of cake, a walk in the park. <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears, that's uh, that's all I can say about that. But that's what's amazing, though, about for that process and that journey, for it to seem that seamless and just mm -hmm. kind of ordained. Like, that's what I told Jean when we first talked, is that I, I fell in love with her narrative voice, which to me felt like George Eliot, and it's like all-knowingness, it's, it's omnipotence, it's just care with every single character and being able to track them at any given moment and finding the humor in tough circumstances and for that result to have come out of that process is really inspiring frankly <laughs> i could do that the pain though <laughs> next yeah time. yeah fair enough fair enough 
Well, I think you had a good point, Julia. Um, Jean's got such a distinct narrative voice. And, you know, the setting of this book, when it's set in New York, I mean, just it breathes off the page. And I know, you know, you had a hand in doing that when I listened to the audio book as well. Um, a question about, you know, Jean's editing process. Is there any sort of editing process in the, narr the narration of an audiobook? Do you read um, linearly all the way through? Do you tackle sections? How does that work? Yeah, you read page one to the end, you read straight through. Um, so all of my like editorial process, if you can call it that happens before I ever step in the booth. That's part of the prep, the conversations, the figuring out like what's the plan of attack. And then once I'm done recording, I send the raw files to the publisher and there's a, a proofer who listens to everything I did and marks every mistake that I made and then sends them back to me for correction. And that's always the mortifying part. And then um, I do all of it because I'm like, how did I think that was the right word? Like, how did I, that doesn't even make sense. But like when you're in the story and you're just trying to tell the story, like nonsense comes out. And, um, and so then they send back the uh, packages of pickups and, um, and I do the pickups and I send them back and then they drop them into the, fi the final file. They master it, they sweeten it, they make it sound hey, wait, what is as flawless as the book. What is I mean, they have their way of like adjusting levels and, you know, cleaning up the audio so that it just sounds like it was, that it's perfect. And, I guess that's yeah. the equivalent of being copy edited because when you're copy edited, you feel so clean. You feel like yeah. come along and just scrubbed you and made you perfect. I yes. love copy edited. It makes me, it makes me so happy. So it's an exfoliation. You're right. It's just like oh. the word exfoliation. Yeah. 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 Right. Unfortunately, they don't get everything. I, I, I have found a few things in the book that, that drive me insane. And then, you know, people write to you and they, they tell you, you got this wrong, which is, all you know, like you should be a copy editor and a publisher. <laughs> well, I, I am, a, I do copy it. I, I am the secret uncredited and unpaid copy editor of a notorious website um, that I just copy edit for the pure pleasure of copy editing. And also, cause I believe in the mission of the website, but yes, it, it, it makes me happy to clean up people's uh, bad prose. That's definitely true. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you what it is. At least I don't, I don't, I don't want people mad at me. Keep drinking. Keep drinking. <laughs> Maybe later. We'll come back. We'll circle back. <laughs> well, you know, Julia, you've done some acting work. And so in your narration prep, you know, do you read a book like multiple times through to where you're trying to memorize lines essentially or are you just you read it once and then you just hop in the booth and see what happens or yeah no there's there's no memorization possible um there's just too much content and and it's too quick I mean I'm I do at this point I mean I've cut way back and I still do like 30 to 35 books a year um but I the the main thing for me from like the acting perspective is you know, obviously you're asking the same basic questions of your characters that you're asking if you're playing them on camera. What do they want? What is the conflict? Um, and I think that for me, like the difference is that I kind of have to have a directorial uh, point of view that's different from just being an actor where you're just responsible for your one character um, and they call you in when they need you. <laughs> this is like, plate spinning and having a kind of bird's eye view of the whole project and all of the characters. Um, so in this book, particularly, you know, the, the main task becomes you have these three core siblings who could not be more different. So, you know, Jean wrote them that way. They're all written very distinctly. How do I best interpret that for the listener is what the question becomes. Um, and yeah, I think I'm relying mostly on just the, my acting background and, uh, you know, <laughs> at this point, the like decades that I have in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You've been doing it a while. <laughs> I a while. watch uh, Julia when she was on Once and Again, which was a TV show that I loved. And you were just a little girl, right? You were I was high school. I was high school. Yeah. So, yeah. so I knew who she was. You know who I was, which helped. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, so we've talked about the length of the book. This is a big Jewish American family drama. So let's chat a bit about the members of the family. And the book opens with the patriarch, Salo Oppenheimer, being involved in an event that will follow and influence him for the rest of his life. He loves art, arguably more than his family. Oh, I don't think there's any argument. (laughs) No. So let's just talk a a little bit about, you know, why you opened the book the way that you did and chose that kind of just to be the driving force, at least for the first portion of the book. I have to give my editor credit for this because um, one of the big editorial insights she had was that the the, the, the novel is in three parts. One is about the parents, one is about the triplets, and one is about this child born much later. Until really the last couple of drafts, parts one and two were reversed. So it uh, originally the book began with the triplets leaving for college, and then I went back and, and talked about the parents. And she said, you know, would you ever consider flipping those two? And the minute she said that, I went, oh my God. Um, which means that we really open chapter one, paragraph one with this terrible event. Um, Somebody said to me, this is like a kind of a Victorian novel, which which makes sense to me because that was sort of my period when I was briefly considering being an academic. Um, But it it begins with an an accident and unfortunately it was based on a real accident. that happened to people I knew many, many, many years ago in which um, four college students were out for a drive in the country and uh, the Jeep, and this was the early 1980s, just flipped over, it just flipped over. Yeah, I, think the, I think it hit a rock, it flipped over, two people died uh, and, and two people walked away, including the, uh, the driver. And I wondered for years, um, how he lived, what, what, what was it like to be him? He became a doctor. I actually ran into him years later in an emergency room. He was a doctor. Um, what was his life like? I mean, how do you make peace with yourself? I mean, he killed his best friend and his fiance. It was not, these were not uh, you know, people he didn't know. Um, and so that sort of stayed with me for years. And uh, I have a way of when I'm trying to figure out who a character is, sometimes I'll remember something, um, someone I knew, something I read, something I, saw in, something I saw on television once, and they get a fix to these characters. And that was really how this character began. So what he discovers is that he has, um, th- that art has a capacity to, to offer him some kind of solace. And so he becomes a passionate collector of art. He's not interested in the uh, reputation of the artist. He's not even interested in the biography of the artist. He doesn't care about anything. He certainly doesn't care about making money. He has plenty of money. He's not investing uh, for financial gain. He doesn't even want anyone else to see the work. So basically throughout his life, he assembles this private museum of um, 20th century, mostly American artists. And because I am not a person who knows a great deal about art, I took advantage and, uh, you know, prepare for the name drop here um, of my friend, Steve Martin, who is a a great collector and an extremely knowledgeable um, collector of art. And he helped me to create the fantasy collection of this fictional character. And he had a really good job doing it too, because what I was asking him to do was, you know, go back to the 70s and 80s, pretend that you have all the money in the world, but you're buying for passion. But I want everything you buy to be magnificently valuable several decades later. I mean, I want, I wanted the character to have that prescience about, um, you know, see a Hockney, buy a Hockney, see a Twomley, buy a Twomley, you know, just everybody that he buys turns out to be, you know, amazing. And of course, it doesn't matter that, you know, these paintings that my character buys and stows away in Brooklyn are hanging in the Tate and, you know, Museum of Modern Art, because this is my novel and I can control everything in it. So that was a lot of fun. And I gave oh. you know, lots of artist names to have to pronounce, some of which I can't pronounce myself. We found them though. Yeah. We found them. At least with like 90% confidence, <laughs> we found them. Well, there are plenty of people, you know, spouting on about art who have more confidence for less 
reason than I'm- this is very oh yes it possibly that industry more than any other. Yeah. <laughs> right well um I think you did a great job with the names because I did listen to the audiobook in addition to reading it and you know just sitting here talking to you as the audiobook queen in my world with yeah. my Texas accent I'm just like oh gosh please don't take offense if I bungle any kind of pronunciation this evening okay sure <laughs> Go well, that's it. the thing we always I mean look the part of it is like the, we do set this standard for ourselves of you know we want things to be pronounced correctly but correctly is a slippery slope and like we you know we live in a very pluralistic society and accents change things and I you know it, it is it does feel a little bit it's always odd to me that we try we rely so heavily on trying to get things right and you know it can be different for everybody. And I have a vague memory that I told you, Julia, this story, but um, just to drive that point home, many, many years ago, I was an editorial assistant in New York City at Ferrar Strauss and Giroux, and uh, Presumed Innocent had just come out. And one day I was alone in the office. I'm sure my boss was out taking, you know, Philip Roth out for lunch or something. And I was alone in the office and the phone rang and it was the recording studio where they were recording or about to start recording Presumed Innocent. And Presumed Innocent, as I'm sure many of us remember, uh, is set in a Chicago-like city and it's full of, you know, Polish characters, <laughs> Italian characters, Slavic characters. And they put me right on the phone with John Hurd, Hurt, and he wanted me to pronounce all of these characters' names for him. Like I was, I was the editorial assistant, you know? I, I hadn't even been involved in the editing of that book. I came in later. I mean, I felt for years, I've been afraid to listen to that book, wondering if I gave the narrator the wrong pronunciation. So if anybody has listened to Presumed Innocent lately and remembers a bad pronunciation, just don't blame the narrator, blame me. Well, the great thing is now with the internet, they can let you know. Oh, good. good. Yeah, they'll let you know. Don't <laughs> well, worry. Well, let me know because I was the secret. That's crit- my favorite. Uh, yeah, that's my favorite thing is the people who like are like you pronounce this wrong, and I'm and it, sometimes that absolutely happens. Sometimes that is totally true. They found some research I could not find, and that is true. But sometimes, more often than not, they don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. You're pronouncing it the way What's their dad the first pronounced word? it. What's the most common word that you are accused of having mispronounced? <sighs> it's not a specific, it's not a specific, that's a good question. I would have to think about that one. I feel like it's not a specific, there's not like a, a word, but it's usually a regionalism that has been like drilled into someone or it's just the way their dad said it when they were growing up. So they think that's the way it was pronounced. And then they come to me saying you pronounced it wrong. And I have to be like, Sir, no, I didn't. <laughs> um, but I'll think about the words. Mm. Yeah. So, so being from Texas, when I list, I listen to a lot of audiobooks like Jean. And so whenever I hear a character set in Texas and I hear a narrator, I'm like, is that really what we sound like? Because I'm not quite sure, but maybe it is. <laughs> I mean, they probably dial it up a little bit when they need to, you know? I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. Like, you just want to tweak it up just a bit. Yes. I mean, there's definitely a Texas stereotype, so I get it, but <laughs> well, um, so going, <laughs> what is that? There's an everything stereotype. That is sure so out. Every, everybody has their own stereotype. <laughs> well, Julia, so going back to the, this book being on such a grand scale, both in size and scope, how did those things in particular factor into the narration from your end? Uh, yeah, so for me, I, I mean, I think Jean just said exactly what I was trying to say inelegantly before, which is like, it feels Victorian in that, that, that capability of just a strong narrative voice that is taking you along for the ride and we're moving linearly. Like, that's fascinating to me that that wasn't the original um, structure. So for me, it was like, I knew that this was going to be a pretty slow burn for a listener. Um, mm-hmm. And I like, like I said, I love it because I was hanging on every sentence of hers, just being like, this is incredible. But for me, I really took the task as like creating a very steady, competent, authorial voice at the beginning Mm -hmm. that would sustain the kind of ramp up to 
the reveal, um, but that would not intrude on the narrative. Like I wanted to be a stand-in for Jean as much as possible without doing flourishy narrator stuff. Wow, what's <laughs> so flourishy let that... narrator stuff? <laughs> You know, like really leaning into the emotion heavily, like creating, mimicking your narrative voice and the the kind of distance you were giving it without letting like the actor part of me really take over, I think. Letting that be in the characters, but there's not in the first part, there's really not a ton of dialogue. Mm. Like if you think about it, like mm -hmm. the latecomer section there's more talking because they have to talk. Yeah. But totally. in the beginning, but in the beginning, there's not, there's not a ton of dialogue. So really just trying to let the narrative voice be the main character, which it is, but mm -hmm. we don't know that yet. Right. So interesting. I, I never thought of it like that, but of course you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm right. I could have been wrong. That would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so then we have the triplets at the beginning of the book, in the middle of the book, Harrison, Lewin, and Sally, all of which aren't particularly likable 100% no. of the time. Uh, they dislike each other. They cannot wait to get out of the house, away from each other, basically disowning each other to a certain extent. Which one was your favorite to write about, Jean, and why? And then <laughs> going to follow up with you, um, Julia, which was your favorite to narrate, but... Uh, well, I, I both love and dislike all three of them, um, but for pure pleasure, it has to be Harrison because Harrison is such an asshole. He really is reprehensible. He's, he's a terrible snob. He's, uh, you know, at one point he's described as one of those people the president likes to call late at night. And I think you know what president I mean. He's just uh, a real young conservative firebrand he becomes this you know I think one of his siblings refers to him as on a mission to make the world more awful <laughs> so he's just he's just disgusting he's really disgusting I mean politics aside he's just a nasty piece of work so he of course was a lot of fun to write and to give him some kind of a, some form of a redemptive arc was um harder than the others because you know he, he does he seems to deserve one so little um the other two were a little darker a little more complicated i guess um but i you know not not one of them is somebody i would cross a room to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with at least you know until deep into the novel um, but I, I have always risen in defense of the unlikable character. I am for unlikable characters. And I have heard so many times in my writing life, I just didn't like them. It's usually a, a her, it's usually my protagonist or her, I just didn't like her. And you know, m what I always want to say is, I'm sure she wouldn't like you either, but so what? I mean, that's, is that why you're reading a novel, to find a friend? I mean, we all love Elizabeth Bennet, but she's not particularly likable either. Um, so, I, and again, to go back to the 19th century when the novel was, strictly speaking, novel or new, the likability of, of protagonists was not something that those novelists spent a lot of time worrying about. I think they were much more interested with telling an interesting story. So this seems to be a, a contemporary preoccupation to have, uh, uh, you know, your best friend in the pages of the book. So that's not, it's not going to happen probably in this book. And Julia, did you have a particular character that you liked to give the voice to? Yes, and she's getting me thinking about, I just had this conversation recently about this, you're right, this emphasis on likability. And to me, again, I think it's coming from an acting background, but like, that's never the goal. Like, understandability is mm -hmm. the goal. Mm -hmm. And understanding how someone is the way they are and why they're doing what they're doing is the goal. And so for me, I agree that I think Harrison was probably my favorite to do because I, you know, I'm never going to get to play someone like Harrison, and, you know, I don't get to, I'm never going to get to play Harrison except in the pages of this book. And so 
for me, it was like, I've known guys like that. I, Gene and I kind of have that in common. We've been in a, you know, the, the Americans that sometimes get sent over to British universities to polish up their political skills and then get sent back here are often just odious. Insufferable. They're insufferable. insufferable. But we both spent um, time at Oxford, right? And you probably met some Rhodes Scholars when you were there and they were just they were just unbearable. There, there's just, and there's, and it is, it is an imperialistic notion of, you know, we have to go back to the motherland in order to come back and, you know, teach people how it ought to be done. And, and so there's, but there's something. So once I cracked Harrison, which was like, yes, I don't want to ever know him. I've known too many people like that in my life, but once I cracked that, like, this was a guy who I understood him as a kid, just being frustrated with the world around him, being like, why is everyone so stupid? <laughs> but, but you have to have, you have to have the utter conviction that that means that you are right. Yeah. And that's the part where you can see him comically yeah. because he has no self-awareness that everything he's accusing everyone else of is something that he deeply yeah. <laughs> possesses. Um, so yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed him. Lewin actually kind of just like breaks my heart. Like I loved every moment that I was, he has some beautiful speeches and him trying to figure himself out and narrativizing himself for his little sister was like, just really beautiful. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Lewin goes on a, a quite the spiritual journey and, and just the, those two words, I hate separately spiritual and journey and to put them together <laughs> the only way what he goes through can possibly be described was um was fascinating to write but uh he uh, he is the embodiment of my fascination with mormon culture and history and he wanders pretty far along that road but but i did give him one misadventure that i had myself which is that i too got lost in the sacred grove. <laughs> I was lost in the sacred grove in Palmyra, New York. Um, and I, I thought everybody else knew where they were going. And I was wandering around the woods looking for the sacred grove. And finally I went up to this elderly couple and I said, where is the sacred grove? And they looked at me like I was a complete moron. And they said, you're in it. And I just thought, oh my God, this is, this is the metaphor for my inability to have any- What a metaphor. <laughs> The spiritual understanding at all. I am lost in the sacred grove, never to be found. So that was such a, that was such an amazing experience that I gave it to uh, to Lewin. Um, you know, again, not an autobiographical writer, but you know, when the gods hand you something like that, you say, "I'm going to use that one." And they yeah. that's hilarious. <laughs> I can't believe you held on to it for that many books. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I would have shoehorned it into something so long ago. <laughs> people kept saying to me, you know, you, you know, you, what, what are you doing with this weird Mormon obsession? Where's your Mormon novel? And I finally said, it's coming, and it all went in there. And now I'm not allowed to write about it ever, ever, ever again. Right. But so far, well, people haven't gotten mad at me. So, or maybe they're not reading it out there. Um, I actually know I actually think in all honesty I mean it's like objectively again how you can I think there was a lot of sympathy brought to it and some really good points made and you introduce characters that actually have a good counterweight to like how absurd it may seem on the outside but like the it I if I don't I don't think there's anything to be offended by personally but no. I'm also like kind of impervious <laughs> to being offended and I, I know that's not most people so yeah well I, I I I think I know what you're referring to and I'm yeah that's all that I feel that way as well so um yeah look if Matt oh. Parker and Trey, Trey Parker and Matt Stone could get away with writing the Book of Mormon and uh then what I've done is is Winnie the Pooh compared to that. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I've got some more questions, but if anybody attending the chat live tonight has anything they'd like to get asked, please be sure to put it in the chat function and I'll try to get to it. Um, so circling back to the rest of the family, we've got Joanna, the mom who views her kids as kind of like her pride and joy, her greatest accomplishment, but has to accept the reality of their family life isn't necessarily as picture perfect as she has built it up or would like to believe and she makes this shocking decision later in life to have 
a redo um, with her last embryo. So just, you know, talk about Joanna's mindset throughout the book. And I mean, I know the reason she made the decision that she did, but let's just chat a little bit about her. So ironic because of all these characters, probably the one that's closest to me in age and biography and life circumstances would be Johanna. But um, I think I knew her least of all. She Mm -hmm. she was the one who remained uh, unclear to me for the longest time. Um, I think she stakes her life and her idea of her self-worth on one uh, untenable project, which is to um, redeem her husband from the suffering that she perceives him correctly to be in. But she makes this fatal error, which is not uh, understanding that she's never going to be capable of of doing that. And in fact, there is only one person in the world of this novel who is capable of doing that, and it's not her. So Mm -hmm. her entire life goes towards this you know, I always think of that that uh, famous story, the necklace, the Guy de Maupassant story, the necklace about this French couple who borrow an expensive necklace and they lose it and they spend their lives, you know, in drudgery trying to pay back the debt um, for this necklace, only to discover, okay, now I, I now I can't tell you what they discover because it's will ruin it, but to discover that that was never what was happening and it's mm-hmm. just well there goes my life so um there was a bit of that going on mm-hmm. I agree that um I don't want to say underdeveloped but I felt like I, I knew her the least out of all of the characters um so uh Liz had asked what was behind the triplets disliking each other so much to that extent it just they came out of the womb just I could answer that but I I feel that the the book it takes 450 pages to to answer that. I believe that the book does uh, offer an answer to that. Okay. And if you if you read the book and you still are in the dark, I, I encourage you to please contact me <laughs> through my website and I will nail it home for you. But um, I, I really, in my mind, I have a very clear understanding of why they are so kind of fatally, immediately, and uh, perhaps permanently uh, disoriented toward one another. Oh, okay, Liz, I'll look for your, <laughs> I'll look for your email. <laughs> um, Julia, Liz had also asked earlier, how did you get into this field of, of voiceover work and narration? Uh, yeah, I am um, one of my best friends in college. Her mother happened to be an audiobook director and producer at a company called Brilliance. And at my college graduation, she came up to me and she knew my background as an actor. Um, she'd been a fan of the show, but she also knew that I had this English and creative writing degree. And it was, you know, I think a kind of like maternalistic, like, what are you going to do with that, honey? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, she'd, you know, she said, do you, I think you might enjoy this. And I'd never listened to an audiobook before. I didn't know anything about it. And I really thought that I was going to graduate and go back to LA and like get my old job back. And, you know, um, and that's not what happened because the industry had changed so much in the time I'd been at school. And I'd also been at school. I was, I didn't have anything current on my resume. You know, I'd just been like hiding in Vermont and England. And, and uh, so after about a year of like, realizing that this was this was going to be harder than I thought it was going to be I called her and I was like do what I don't understand like I read a book into a microphone and she said yes and I sent her a demo and uh, she gave me two young adult novels Um, and then it just kind of I remember being like if I could just do a book a month that would be great that would help take the pressure off I was tutoring in LA um And within like three or four years, I realized this was kind of what I was supposed to be doing. And um, it became a full-time job. But you were so happy. Writer yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then that, that during that time I was, you know, I graduated with a thesis that was a novel in stories as you're supposed to do as a creative (laughs) writing major, Um, only to realize that no one wants your novel in stories about your hometown. Um, 
and uh, but I was I was working on a couple of different things at the time, and um, and I think I paused writing. I was doing a lot of screenplay work, but I was I paused writing for like the first few years of my career because I was not good enough at either to keep the voices straight in my head. Like jumping into another author's world every like four days. That's how much I was recording, and then like trying to stay in my voice as I was writing was not working. So. Interesting. Well, um, we also loved my Oxford years. We do recommend it in the group and it still gets brought up in discussions. So, and um, we're very excited about your upcoming book as well. Thank you for listening. I believe it comes out first bit of August. So everybody keep that one on your radar as well. Um, Simone asked, what was your first book that you narrated? Can you remember? (laughs) I can. It was these two books. I I narrated... um, Need by Carrie Jones, which was a YA novel about um, a girl who moves from North Carolina to Maine only to fall in with like a group of uh, pixies. And, (laughs) um, and then, and it's delightful. And then love, peace, love and baby ducks by Lauren Myrickle set in, set in Georgia. So um, like a boarding school culture, private school culture in Georgia. And they were both great. And I was just like oh I love this I love this everything about this is like my dream job well it was kind of speaking of boarding schools um Liz had had another question for you Jean why did the younger sister go to the same school as the jerky brother why did they choose to go to the same school together since I think neither of the oh uh oh, oh I thought you're not talking about the triplets you're talking about that I think comes under uh something not to be revealed so i'm gonna not reveal that i'm sorry um okay yeah yeah there's a there's a kind of a a a running joke through the novel about a a real book called colleges that changed lives which is a real book that 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 just keeps popping up in in the novel and i had a lot of fun with that um there is a, a, a fictional very odd school that one of the triplets goes to, which is is not a real school, although it does uh, share some DNA with a place called Deep Springs, which is in California, and it's a very interesting, fascinating place. Actually, I read a book about it. Um, but this uh, this this fictional school appears in this real book called Colleges That Change Lives. So that that's a bit of a running theme. Sorry, oh. sorry not to be able to answer that question. That's okay. Um, Jennifer had asked, did you go to Cornell and or how did you decide to portray it the way that you did in the book? Because her daughter is going to start there in less than a month. Cornell's a great school. I did not go there. I am a proud Dartmouth graduate. Um, I have written about Dartmouth. I've written about Princeton. I've written, you know, less centrally about Yale. I know this makes me sound really elitist. Um, it, It really was a question of not wanting to go back uh, to a place that I had already written about. So uh, Cornell just seemed like the right school for Sallow to have gone to. And uh, that kind of had a knock-on effect of his two of his children going there as well. Mm-hmm. And I have personally been to Ethica, I think three times. The, the third time I had a long list of things I had to see. I, I'm like <laughs> stealing, sneaking my way into certain dormitories and walking up and down the stairs and the corridors just so that I can see what they look like. I think at one point I described the the plaster on the on the floors and you know that was just kind of sneaking in and looking at stuff. And mm-hmm. and and I this is also a bit of a joke in the book, but Cornell is stunning, but it is the most confusing campus ever because it is all laid out along these gorges and these ravines and you really have no idea where you are at any time, or at least I don't. So hopefully once your child um, goes there, they will impress you by how they know their way around. But you, when you visit, will be completely baffled. You will have no idea where you are. Well, um, I want to try to start to wrap this up because I know your time is precious, but I also don't want to let this chat in without us getting to Phoebe, the latecomer child. Um, You know, she is, in a sense, is getting a different growing up experience than her older siblings did. You know, her parents are older. 
she has older siblings, whereas they did not have those. And so, and they're also not really invested in her journey. Um, it's kind of two different separate families going on at the same time. What do you hope the readers take away from the juxtaposition? Well, I, I started to think about this phenomenon of, you know, the, the much later born child, which is not reliant on, on artificial anything. I mean, in this case, these are in vitro children, but um, one of the books that got me started thinking about all this was a, a, a memoir by an English writer named Susie Boyd called My Judy Garland Life. And it's really about, you know, she grew up in this kind of famous English bohemian family um, that during the 60s and 70s was off around the world having all these great adventures. But by the time she was born, about 13 years after her uh, next sibling, it was her and their mom, divorced mom in a flat in London. And, and she describes in her memoir, you know, how people would say to her, oh, I know all about your exotic family and your great adventures. And she would say, actually, that was my older siblings. I just grew up in London with a single parent, you know, it was just a completely different family. So um, Phoebe is the missing link um, to her family. She is the one who has to solve the problem um, that she has been presented with through no fault of her own. And this is her mission and it's her, you know, it, it, it's something that she undertakes, I think with great bravery and great decency. Decency is sort of her, her weapon and she wields it differently with all the people in her family and uh, she's a she's terrific she was definitely the most likable to me so. yeah, well there you go but I love I love that comment though that I think it's Lewin who makes you know when when he first tells her like who she is and how this happened and she's like but so I could have been it could have been you and me and Sally and he was like yes and I probably would have had a much nicer child <laughs> like I think that I, I, it does like the, the kind of thought experiment of that, of like, if she had been one of the triplets, would they have been so right. like right. magnetically repulsed from each other? Right. Um, if she had been there as a, as a glue, right. um, in any of the configurations. It's completely true. And, you know, think about our own families, how birth order is so important. And, and, you know, it, in a way you can say it's a new family every time a a new child is born because the parents go, go from not knowing anything to maybe knowing too much. You're getting a different experience. So maybe not in the Alec Baldwin family, maybe <laughs> there's so many of them, I don't know, they're having the same family experience. But for most of us, um, the difference between having new parents who don't know what they're doing to parents who, you know, I, I remember reading a biography of Teddy Kennedy. And I remember being very struck by something that the writer wrote about how by the time he was born, his mother was tired. She was mm -hmm. tired. You know, it's nothing to do with, it was that many years after the last child. She had just read that same going to bed book 12 times by then, and she was tired. So, you know, it doesn't take uh, 20th century interventions to, to create that problem. Mm -hmm. Well, Julia, um, this Julia, is the first time. That we're... Now, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am going to wrap it up. Julia, this is the first time we've had an audiobook narrator with us. So um, any tips, tricks, kind of suggestions for someone who might be interested in that line of work? Oh, uh, yeah. I always, I always tell people, put it in the chat. I always tell people to go to narrator's roadmap um which is uh karen commons is a wonderful narrator and she has actually taken the time to compile all of the resources that you could possibly need starting out but also for um experienced narrators just looking to like level up um and you know i it's a very different industry now than it was when i started so i'm terrible about advice for like how to get into it now because it's a different world it people actually know what it is now <laughs> um so uh but definitely that's the that's the place to to go oh wait you're muted me no i was muted my kids are going to bed so. <laughs> um <laughs> 
So uh, we love to end our chats by asking our guests, what are you currently reading and loving and recommending or listening to, whichever your preference? Um, Jean, Julia? Um, well, I was prepared for this question. So I I'm on a little bit of a Kevin Wilson kick. So I just finished... Um, I just finished Nothing to See Here, which I've been meaning to read for a while. And then I have an advanced galley of his new book, which is called Now is Not the Time to Panic. And just as I was trying to get on an hour ago uh, and, and not succeeding, I looked down and I saw the title of this and I thought, don't panic, it'll be fine. Um, and I'm listening to uh, a novel in stories uh, called The Imperfectionist, which I've been meaning to read slash listen to for some time, and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, so this is the embarrassing part where I have to admit that, like, I don't read electively. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, I haven't read something for fun in like a really long time, um, but I will say that I am prepping and getting ready to record the new uh, Cormac McCarthy novels and um, whew, man. Wow. Very much enjoying, enjoying uh, that. Yeah. Um, like just gut punch after gut punch after gut punch um so that's been that's been incredible um and yeah I'm in a little bit of a recording hiatus right now because of promotion for thank you for listening so I'm like out of the booth for the first time in a while and man what a world so exciting well <laughs> if you don't mind can you just give us a little bit of a teaser about thank you for listening while we've got you Sure. So th thank you for asking, but, um, the, this is, the, I'm also dreadful at elevator pitches and they're, they're, they sprawl. So I'm going to try to do this very quickly. It is about a former actress turned audiobook narrator who suffered a pretty tragic accident that ended her on camera career. And she has found herself doing this job that she loves, but she can't totally embrace because it's not, it wasn't the plan and it's not what she sh is supposed to be doing. Um, and she has sworn off narrating romance because she doesn't buy what romance is selling, but she gets an offer to record the last novel of in a fantastic, like legendary romance novelist, who's actually the novelist who gave her her start in the industry. And the money is too good to pass up. She is in the process of trying to caretake her um, grandmother. And so she says, fine, I'll do it. And through her a developing relationship through texts and emails that she has with her co-narrator who happens to be the industry's hottest, most enigmatic male voice. She mm -hmm. learns what it's like to take a risk and what can come out of that. And it's a journey of self-acceptance and love and self-love and whew, there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We well, got to the basement. you did a good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need this right now. <laughs> Two weeks. Two, Two weeks. weeks. Right. Two so. weeks. Well, if you're in the PMBC, keep an eye out on that Tuesday because we might have a giveaway to um, promote Julia's book. Oh, <laughs> well, exciting. exciting. You heard that here first on the chat tonight. So, um, Jean, <laughs> I think that you are presently taking some well-deserved time off and focusing on your adaptation stuff. So we really can't wait to see um the plot being adapted not, and then... I'm not involved in the adaptations at all I wish, oh. I wish I were more involved I'm I'm cheerleading from the sidelines but uh the plot is is going to be filmed I believe in January and it's going to star Mahershala Ali which is incredibly exciting and uh we we know a lot less about the late comer because it came later so sure all right, ladies. But are you, well, can, wait, can I ask? I'm sorry. I just have to ask though. Jean, are you, are you jumping into another um, book or are the theater projects keeping you busy? I, um, I, I'm, I spent the day today thinking I have nothing to do today. I should be writing. I mean, the guilt is starting to really. Oh God. I have to, um, <laughs> I have to start soon, but, but the fact is I'm exhausted. I mean, I, this was two novels in five years and that's I, ridiculous. I, I'm just prostrate on, you know, on the floor basically. But, but as I also, as I've told you, my, the biggest thing in my life this summer is my son's play, which is about to open in New York and I'm in full stage mom mode and about to be 
I'm going to be like that person on the sidewalk outside the theater going, isn't it great? Isn't it great? great? Tell me what you thought. (laughs) What did you think? Isn't it great? So yeah, if you come see my son's play and a weird woman comes up to you afterwards, that will be me. Um, Always assume that woman's the mother. Always. 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 Right. So, I mean, that's what the summer is about for me. Um, but yes, I do have to start. Uh, I, I have to get started soon. Yeah. Well, it's easy for me to say, don't rush it, let the brilliance come, but I'm sure you've got deadlines. So. I, yeah, I, I, I am so fortunate in that I have an editor and an agent who really understand me now and they, they know that I'm gonna do it. And once I get going, it will go fast, but um, yeah, there's a lot of self-flagellation going on at the moment. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for taking a little bit of your time this evening to come and chat with the Peloton Moms Book Club. We love the latecomer. We love the plot. We can't wait for, thank you for listening, Julia. Um, we appreciate your time and wish you both the best of luck with whatever you've got working on right now. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. This was great. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Bye.